Hey all and welcome back to another awesome tutorial. In today's video I'll be walking you through the process on building a paper building kit and creating a super realistic diorama to go with it. I'll be adding loads of extra detail to the kit to really make it stand out. It's amazing what some tiny and seemingly insignificant details can do to really bring a diorama to life. So let's not waste any more time and get started building. This is a laser cut paper kit from Markenberg. They have a huge range of buildings and structures which is linked in the description. The kit I'm building for this diorama is kit number 9-13. It's a group of shops with apartments above. Everything in the kit is pre-cut and some kits also come with additional 3D printed details. This particular kit has some 3D printed stairs. Some basic tools that you'll need are simply a good sharp hobby knife with some spare blades. Also some selections of glue. I used 3M Super 77, Helmar Super Tac glue and Micromark liquid PSA. Also a machinist block can help but aren't entirely necessary. The instructions are quite basic, just two pages. But construction is very easy, so a simple set of instructions is all that's needed. Basically all you need to do is just match up the letters. Each part will be clearly marked, so it shouldn't be too hard to figure out where each part is positioned. Once the small tabs are cut, the parts can be removed from the carrier sheet. It's important to test fit each part before gluing. All parts should fit together seamlessly, but just in case it's always a good idea to test fit it first. If anything, it will prevent you from gluing parts in an incorrect position. Once you're happy the parts fit properly, it's time to glue. Halmar Super Tac works really well for this. It grabs fast so you don't need to wait long for the glue to hold. Glue application is done with a micro brush. Because the glue dries quite fast, I only work one part at a time. Applying glue, waiting for it to set, and then moving on. I'm a little more liberal when applying the glue to the inner frame, that way I know it will have a good strong foundation. Here you can see how the letter system works. All the letter B parts intersect. Letter C is next and so on until the entire model is assembled. A lot of this build is quite repetitive so I'll fast forward through the parts that are repeated multiple times. Before you know it, the skeleton is assembled. The windows are removed and just like we did with the skeleton, the parts are test fitted. Most parts have a small tab that aligns with the slot in the skeleton. That way everything is perfectly aligned and you won't accidentally put something on backwards. The window glazing is also laser cut and fits very precisely. Here's where the liquid PSA comes in handy. It's great stuff and perfect for jobs like this. A small amount is applied to the back of the window frames, just a small bead. It doesn't need much at all. Next just wait for the glue to turn clear. It will probably take about 5 minutes or so. Then very carefully line up the glazing and gently lower it onto the window frames. It will pretty much grab instantly. Then just press down on the glazing to permanently attach it to the window frame. The liquid PSA is slightly flexible, so you can gently press and move the paper window frame afterwards to get it to perfectly line up. This process is repeated for all the windows on the model. And then again the pieces are test fitted. Each window has a window sill. There is a small tab cut out just below each window. The seals get pressed through from behind and glued which is slightly more difficult when you have a dog that is terrified of thunder. Before attaching the outer shell, I'm adding shop interiors first. Basically, the dimensions for each shop are measured and pictures of shops downloaded from Google are scaled down to fit. I create a back wall, side walls and a floor. I also print curtains for the upstairs apartments. The images are printed out and cut out. Then they get glued to some thin acrylic sheet that will form the box shape. But first to ensure the glue holds, the acrylic is sanded so the surface isn't so smooth. 3M Super 77 works really well here. Now the images are pressed onto the acrylic and once fixed the box is assembled and glued together. I also cut out the front counter and offset it from the back wall to give it a bit of a parallax effect. 
each shop should slide right into position. With all the effort to create the interiors, we should light it up. For that I'm using some strip LEDs. I also cut out a few extra strips and add lights to some apartment windows as well. Small holes are cut into the skeleton so the wires can be hidden inside the model. Then each shop is pushed back into the skeleton and permanently fixed into position with some hot glue. Now the LED strips can be added. Once the wires have been threaded through the model, the LEDs are fixed. The strips have an adhesive backing, however I also add a bead of hot glue across each strip just to make sure it stays in position. It doesn't look like much now, but with the lights down, it really stands out. I also add the curtains to the apartment windows as well, in a similar way to how the glazing was added. Some liquid PSA is added around the frame of the window. Once it is turned clear, the curtain is orientated, making sure to not accidentally put it on upside down. Then it's pressed down onto the window frame. Now we're ready to attach the outer skin. For large flat pieces that press against the opposite flat piece like the shed, I use 3M Super 77. It's a simple matter of applying the spray adhesive to the back of the skin and then carefully lining up the part and pressing it on. Just be sure to do this slowly and carefully because the spray adhesive is quite strong. To ensure good adhesion, I make sure to press along the entire area. For areas like this top section that are connected to the ribbed part of the skeleton, I use super tack adhesive. Glue is added along each rib and then the skin is pressed on afterwards. Because the glue dries quite fast, I just do one small area at a time. The outer skin sections are quite flexible, so I don't have any trouble getting glue behind the remaining sections with a long microbrush. Every now and again you might find some tabs that need a little motivation to fit. This process is repeated for the remaining skin sections. As each new section has glue applied and then pressed into position on the model, it starts to come to life very quickly. Sometimes it's hard to believe it's a paper model because the detail in the laser cut paper is so intricate, especially the brick sections. It also becomes quite rigid that there are multiple layers one over the other which helps the model build up strength. There were a couple of times where I wasn't sure how the parts went together and the printed out instruction images were quite small. But the good thing is the instructions are downloaded so you can read the instructions straight from an iPad or computer and zoom in to get better clarification, which was really helpful when assembling the shop awnings. Once again, test fitting is vital because I found a small amount of excess cardboard that needed trimming. For the roof, I not only used Super 77, but also added a few drops of super tack adhesive across the roof as well, just to make sure it's held down well because it's quite a large section. Detail like the trim that goes around the windows really makes this kit pop. It also adds a three-dimensional effect, which makes it hard to tell that it's a paper kit. Not only that, but the paper used has a nice matte finish, so you don't get any reflections when you've viewed from an angle. Fine detail like the handrails that run along the back of the model are the kinds of detail that help set this paper kit aside from other paper kits that are available. We're almost done with the building. There are some really fine intricate chimneys that are assembled. These are a little more challenging to put together simply because they are so tiny, but one detail that is certainly worth the effort. As for the 3D printed stairs, they get a coat of paint. Then once dry, they are glued onto the wall, shortly followed by the handrails. And that completes the building. Next, I design and build a range of details to add to the building, like roof vents and air conditioners, as well as a range of other details to populate the street scene that will be home to the building. 3D printing is becoming much more accessible these days, and it's great for a hobby like model railroading. It gives us unlimited opportunity to add detail to bring our layouts to life. For this I'm using the Ben A4 Mono 3D printer, which you'll see in many of my previous videos. I've had this printer for three years now, and I haven't had any problems. After a few hours of printing, the parts are ready for assembly and painting. The process is much the same for all 3D printed parts, however the street lamps are a little different, so I'll step you through the process. 
Once the part has the supports removed and any imperfections are cleaned up, I can attach the separate pieces. For the lamp post, I'm using steel tube. This is so the LED wires can pass through the center of the lamp and also give it some strength. The tube is cut down to the desired size, allowing a little extra to pass through the base of the lamp. This will help later when attaching the lamps to the scene. To attach the top, a small drop of superglue is used. A small mark is drawn onto the tube to line up the base so all the posts are the same height. For the base, I use some super tack adhesive. This gives me a bit of extra working time to ensure the posts are set to the correct height. Once the base is set, I also added a small drop of superglue just to help secure the tube as the super tack adhesive is slightly flexible even when fully cured. The LEDs I'm using are pre-wired 0.1mm SMD LEDs. They are tiny. The fine wire has an insulation that can be burnt off using a soldering torch. The wires at the top are painted white. To paint, I firstly apply a silver spray paint. This will help block the LED light from making the 3D printed parts glow. That is followed up with a matte black for the main lamp post color. Once dry, the LED is threaded through the tube. To fix the LED, a small drop of super glue is applied to the light box roof. Then the LED is pressed into the glue holding it at the top of the lamp. For the glass, I'm using Micro Crystal Clear. Using a small pick, some crystal clear is dragged down the small window opening. It should grab along the edges leaving a film of crystal clear across the opening. Once dry it will be clear, however I want a frosted glass look. So once it had time to dry, I went over the glass area with some Tamiya Flat Clear. This leaves a nice translucent frosted glass appearance. Now the rest of the 3D printed parts are painted and weathered. Some parts like the payphone also had extra effects like lighting added, however this time I wanted the LED to make the top of the roof glow. Signs were also made using the technique shown in one of my older videos here, specifically describing the process for making awesome street signs. Now onto the base. It's simply some insulation foam board with a pine frame around the base. The design is roughly drawn onto the surface, getting an idea of how the scene will be placed. For the footpath, I'm using 3mm PVC foam board. This stuff is perfect for footpaths. It cuts easily, can be sanded, and is really easy to score when adding footpath expansion joints. Just be sure to avoid breathing in the dust from sanding, especially when using the Dremel because it can throw up quite a bit of dust and PVC is not something you want to be inhaling. It also works well for sanding the gutters. However, just take it slow because it's quite easy to accidentally sand away too much material. I used a hobby knife to add expansion joints and then a pin to widen them a little bit. In hindsight, I probably didn't need to widen them any more than just using the hobby knife. The road surface is made using some 1mm styrene sheet. The footpath outline is traced onto the road so that it can be cut out. Styrene is also quite easy to cut. For thin styrene like this, you don't have to cut all the way through. You can just score the styrene and then snap it away. Once cut out and tidied up, it's ready for paint. For painting the road, I'm using a similar technique in a previous video. I won't walk through the process here, however for a more detailed description on painting both the road and footpath, you can watch this video here. I'll also add a link in the description so you can check it out at the end of this video. Road markings are always fun to do, they really bring it to life. To stop paint bleeding under the masking tape, it's a good idea to first use a matte spray first. That will fill any potential gaps under the tape with a clear spray. Once dry, then we can apply the white spray. Once all that is done and dry, the masking tape can come off. The base is painted black, focusing on areas where the road and footpath meet. That way any small gaps won't be so obvious with bright green foam underneath. Before gluing, I make sure to test fit the part, just in case I need to do any extra trimming or adjustments. To glue these down, I'm using polyurethane glue. But first I roughen up the base, so the glue has something to grab onto. Smooth styrene doesn't hold very well. 
I try to avoid applying too much glue, polyurethane glue expands as it cures, and I want to avoid having any glue oozing out from between the gaps. On some areas, like the edge here, I use some pins to help hold it in position. For the rest of it, I use some weights and paint bottles spread over the surface to hold it down and prevent it from moving as the glue expands and cures. Now for some grass. I planned on using the grass mat technique, however I decided to try something different. This time I used some of the remaining styrene to fill the gaps. The edge parts were easy enough to cut to size, however for the odd shapes and inner parts, I traced the outline using a pencil and paper. These shapes are then cut out and stuck onto the styrene with some spray adhesive. Once positioned, each shape was cut out with a hobby knife. Then each part is test fitted just to make sure it fits okay. Before painting and adding grass, the paper templates are peeled away. This should be pretty easy as long as you didn't overdo it with the spray adhesive. Just like the road, the styrene is sanded to make sure the paint and glue will adhere to it. Each piece of styrene is painted brown, so if any spots are missed, there won't be obvious white patches showing through the grass layer. Next, the dirt is added. To help the dirt stick, a misting of scenic glue is added first, shortly followed with the dirt texture. And for some added texture, some coarser dirt is added on top. Now an additional misting of isopropyl alcohol and scenic glue is sprayed on to permanently lock in the layer of dirt. The grass is a mixture of Warworld Scenics patchy 4mm and Woodland Scenics medium green 4mm grass applied using the Static King from Woodland Scenics. The two grasses are mixed roughly one to one and once mixed it's ready to go. To hold the grass down, Mod Podge mat is used straight from the container. Glue is dabbed over the dirt leaving a few bare patches. Next the applicator is turned on the grounding wire held close and the hopper is shaken about 5cm above the surface. Each fibre as it lands on the dirt will stand up, leaving a very realistic looking grass effect. Once done the edges are teased so the grass stands straight and excess is removed by turning it over and tapping on the base. This is repeated for all the other parts. Additional detail is added by sprinkling additional layers of dirt over the grass as well as adding some small weeds and bushes using Woodland Scenics coarse turf. An extra splash of colour using some red and yellow is also used to simulate flowers. This all gets fixed down with a misting of isopropyl alcohol and scenic glue. Once everything is dry, they can be glued onto the diorama. Some parts may need thumbtacks to help secure them. The thumbtacks push through the styrene quite easily However, a little extra motivation was needed to get them into the wooden frame. Before I get too much further, I better make sure to cut the holes for the wires. These are the wires that connect to the shop interiors. Before weathering the road, I add some extra road details like the manhole covers and drains. To weather, I'm using Munro Models Dark Earth Weathering Powder. A little goes a long way with this particular powder, so I start very lightly and gradually build up to the desired effect, focusing the powder down the painted road lines and along the gutters. I also add some of the same powder to the footpath as well, however I'm using a smaller brush on the footpath. Now the model starts to come together really fast, because everything is pretty well done. The details just need to be placed onto the model. Some details like the parking meter and street signs need to have holes drilled first. Just make sure to plan carefully so the post holes are in the right spot. For the street lamps they have their positions marked and then a large 2.5mm hole is drilled. The small block helps me drill the hole as close to vertical as I can. Now I can insert a 2.4mm styrene tube into the hole. This will make it much easier to thread the fine LED wires down through the tube and the 1.2mm steel tube from the light fits perfectly in the styrene tube. This makes it much easier and a lot more accurate when trying to mount the lights. A similar process is used for the payphone as well. 
However, the payphone is mounted to a small wedge that slides into the back of the payphone. More street detail is added. I use Micromark Detail Tack to position the small details. This allows me to move them later if desired without damaging the diorama. Once the glue is applied, I wait for it to dry clear and then place the object into the scene. For all the extra detail on the building, I use Helmar Super Tack Adhesive. This is more permanent as I'm not planning to use these details anywhere else or change them anytime soon. There's heaps of detail right across this model, from the small fuse boxes to the gutters, air conditioners and heaps of roof detail. All of it comes together to create a really awesome and fun looking model. Some light weathering on the building is done with some more of the Munro model's dark earth weathering powder and some grimy black around the chimney. To fix the building into the scene, super tack adhesive is applied in small spots along the base. I don't overdo it on the glue here just in case one day I decide to change the scene and I need to remove the building. That way I can remove it with minimal damage. As the glue dries I weigh the model down, doing my best not to damage any of the fine details. Trees are a must, even for a scene like this. These are super tree material, also known as sea foam, with some coarse turf added over the top. It produces some great looking trees. I try to add trees in positions to help hide the edges of the diorama where possible, which can be a challenge when the edge of the diorama is wood. Now for possibly my favorite detail so far. These are some really cool color 3D printed figures from West Edge 3D. They are the best figures in HO scale I've seen so far. The only downside is they tend to have a bit of a reflection from certain angles depending on how the light hits the model. This is pretty easy to fix though. All of the models are lined up on some tape and then sprayed with some Tamiya Flat Clear. This is an ultra matte spray and will help stop those reflections on the figures. To mount the figures, more detail tack is used. Once the tack is dry, the figures are simply placed in various locations around the scene to tell a story. So far, most of the figures are in neutral poses, which is part of the reason they look so realistic. Lastly, all the wiring for the LEDs and lights are connected, and then we are left with an awesome diorama ready to display. This kit from Markerberg was fun to build and very easy to construct. It looks fantastic when placed in a scene that brings it to life. And we're finally getting figures that look much more realistic. While they are not perfect, they are worlds better than anything that has been available in the past. Not to mention they are printed in full color with intricate patterns on their clothes. The kinds of details that is almost impossible to do by hand. Be sure to check out Markenberg if you'd like to see a full range of their kits. There are heaps of buildings available and a lot of them are generic looking, which is great because they can basically fit in any era and location around the world. This building could easily be in Europe, Australia or America just to mention a few. Just change the signs and you'll be in a different country. I'll have a link in the description. I hope you enjoyed the tutorial and don't forget to subscribe for more. Cheers and thanks for watching.